Good morning. How are we doing? Um, good to see a lot of fun, uh, new faces. Congrats um, to Benzie uh, on getting married last night. I think you're responsible for a lot of the masses here uh, this morning. So um, by and large, you guys probably have not been here over the past few weeks uh, where we have been in a series um, talking about the city, specifically um, as believers um, in a culture and in a city where by and large um, there is a large population of unbelievers. Um, how are we to carry about? How are we to live out our faith together in Christian community amongst um, those who do not relate to us on that level? Um, today we're going to be specifically um, addressing a question, um, what is God's design for his messengers, okay, and what is his design for their ministry? Okay, so as his church, um, how has he designed us um, to go about functioning, and, and how does that affect the way that we reach people who don't know him, who have not called on his name yet. That's the major thing we're going to be asking this morning. Um, as we walk through that question, there's really, um, there's four kind of key points that we're going to land on. Um, and each time when we do that, um, we're going to kind of, we're going to get a glimpse of how it worked in the Old Testament, get a glimpse of how it worked in the New Testament. Um, an analogy I heard one time um, that kind of helped me sort of compare and contrast uh, the differences between the two. Um, Anybody been watching, by the way, anybody been watching the March Madness tournaments, basketballs, anybody else into that? I, uh, I have to laugh at myself every year because I literally do not watch a college basketball game in the regular season. And then uh, the tournament bracket comes out and I'm just pouring over all of this research and how to pick these teams that I know absolutely nothing about other than the little number by their name and their team mascot and things like that. Um, but it's a lot of fun, great sports tournament, um, Friday night. Uh, there was a couple of games going on kind of simultaneously. Um, Kelly and I, we, we actually don't, we don't have cable. Um, so we wanted to watch these games. We figured out we could actually stream them on the computers. Okay, so we have a couple of MacBooks. So we kind of, on our coffee table, um, put our computers up. And we were watching the two basketball games there. Uh, and then we have, we do have a TV. And it's kind of a cool TV. It's like a 40-inch or so TV. It's like HD and everything. Of course, we can't watch the game on that. We're going to watch them on the computers. Um, actually, shamefully, I'll just go ahead and admit, we had some Netflix going on the TV, and it was a program called uh, Too Cute, which is a, a show about, like, baby animals. <laughs> so it's like we got basketball, basketball, puppies. Uh, and that, that was kind of our Friday night. Uh, you know, worked for both genders, and, and, and uh, we enjoyed that a lot. But as we were watching the games, um, we could have watched those same basketball games. We could have projected that if we could have projected that and watched the game on cable, on the TV, we would have watched the same game. There would be the same um, key players, the same key plays, the same coaches, the same score going. Um, the picture would have been a little clearer. Okay, The computers every now and then, every 10 seconds or so, would kind of glitch for a second where it kind of kept you on your toes. Um, but by and large, you're watching the same game with the same key moments Okay, that's driven by the same process, the same rules, okay, the same strategy. Okay, by and large, we can see that consistency throughout our Bible. It looks a little different. Okay, in the Old Testament, it's kind of like watching sort of the pixely screen on our laptops. In the New Testament, we get to see this clear HD picture of God and his character and his commands in the Gospels and the person of Jesus. Okay, so as we walk through and try and answer this question, what is God's design for his messengers and for their ministry, okay, kind of our case study from the Old Testament is going to be Jonah. Um, so if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to the book of Jonah, which is towards the end of the Old Testament, we'll start there. Okay, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Okay, so the first, uh, the first key point as we answer this question, what is God's design for his messengers and for their ministry? Okay, the first thing that we see throughout the Bible is that he uses people to proclaim his truths. Okay, he is a sovereign, all-powerful God. I'm sure he could have gotten the job done however he wanted to, uh, but we see time and time again that he chooses to use people um, to take his message to the masses. Okay, so what we saw right there in Jonah, okay, 
the model of that throughout the Old Testament, they kind of, they call it the prophetic mandate, which is basically um, God delivers this message to the prophet, the prophet receives a message, and the prophet carries out that message, okay? All throughout that, um, the whole Old Testament, okay, the next sentence after something like that happens is, and he went. It's kind of like there's no, you don't ask questions, you know, if, if God's going to directly reveal himself to you and put a mission on your plate, you just go do it. Um, if we flip to the New Testament, if we look, flip to the Gospels, and we look at John, in okay, the book of John, um, chapter 1, verse 14, I think we should project on some of these random passages so you don't have to flip around all morning if you don't want to, but John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Um, the message Bible um, which isn't a great resource to exegete scripture from necessarily, but sometimes they have a cool way of saying things. It says, God put on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And it's kind of that visual of throughout the Old Testament, God is partially revealing himself in these little bits and pieces to these prophets and to these chosen people. They're supposed to take that message to the masses. And then the gospels, everything changes because rather than giving a little bit of himself to a messenger, God comes down in the form of a man, in the form of Jesus. And he lives all that out right in front of our eyes. Okay, so that's the difference between watching the pixely computer screen and seeing the live HD clear picture of God in the flesh in Jesus. Um, Colossians 1 says, says it this way, that, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Okay, that all his characteristics, all of his commands were incarnate in the person of Christ. Okay, so where does that leave us today? Okay, the, the, the canon is closed. The scripture is finished. Um, we look at Romans 10. Okay, Romans 10 is Paul's um, call. It says, verse 14, Romans 10, 14. How then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him and who they've never heard? And how are they to hear something without someone preaching? Okay, and this is a huge verse that you'll hear a lot of times missions organizations come back to, which is if we're supposed to call upon the name of Jesus for salvation, okay, how do we do that if we don't even know his name? Okay, how are we going to hear it without someone introducing it? And that's where we come in. Okay, we are now his present day messengers. Okay, God is no longer coming out, uh, and at least nobody I've talked to, he's no longer speaking directly to us. Um, Jesus laid it all out in front of us. We have the Bible. We have his word. It is now our job to take that word and spread it. Um, to sum up that point, that God uses people to proclaim his truths. Okay, God designed us to be his image-bearing representatives on earth. Okay, and God has designed ministry in such a way that even though all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, okay, he can use ordinary and imperfect people to do extraordinary things. Okay, and that is a theme common through all, throughout all of Scripture, okay, that thoroughly unimpressive and unworthy people like you and I, like Moses, like David, okay, he uses them to do extraordinary things for the kingdom. And he's not asking us to be perfectly able. He's asking us to be readily available. Okay, and I think perhaps the greatest obstacle to our availability um, today, at least, especially in the we our Western culture, um, is our comfort and our convenience. Um, as an illustration, the, the, there's a comedian. Uh, I don't recommend going to Google him because all of his stuff is not necessarily, I can't endorse it up here. But Louis C.K. Um, is kind of a funny sort of comedian. He's, um, I saw a little bit that he did just one time on, on Conan or something like that, which was a lot cleaner, and said, he was just talking about the whole premise of his bit was, was everything is amazing and like nobody's impressed. Like everything is awesome today, and we're like so numb to that fact, um, and we just kind of expect it. And, and there was one illustration in particular I remember he said, he's, he's, he said he was on an airplane flying, and they're, they're up in the air, which first of all, flight, amazing. Second of all, they're in the air, uh, and, the, and the pilot announces, he says, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in a beta testing phase, but we're trying uh, to make wireless internet available to you on our plane, okay? So if, if you open up your computers, you should be able to log on and surf the web from 30,000 feet. Wow. Uh, so he said the guy next to him opens up his computer, and he starts surfing, the, sur surfing on the internet, checking his mail, doing all these things. Then after a few minutes, the pilot comes back on. 
he says, uh, actually, I regret to inform you, uh, it's not quite where it needs to be. The, the internet is, it's actually not going to be able to be accessed from this point forward. So um, we're sorry for the inconvenience. And the guy just slammed his computer screen shut and was just like, Pfft. like, this is, this is BS. And it's just like, how quickly the world owes you something that you found out existed five minutes ago. <laughs> Like, the, you're, the, what a ripoff that there's no longer wireless internet on this airplane. And that cracks me up hearing that. And, and you can think of countless other examples where it's just like we become so accustomed to everything around us tailoring to our needs. We get it as quick and fast, as easy as possible. And everything is going, every industry is going in that direction. Uh, we're getting lazier and lazier. Okay, we're um, craving more and more. Um, that our needs be met, that our comfort is the most important thing and is the top priority. And that stands really in stark contrast um, to as we ask, what is God's design for his messengers and their ministry? The second key point is that his purposes, okay, his purposes must take priority over our personal preferences. Okay, so God, number one, God uses people to proclaim his truths, and all he's asking is that his purposes would take priority over our preferences. Um, and sadly, this is something that we just don't do that well. Um, our needs and our comforts typically are elevated to the topest priority, um, the highest priority in our minds. Um, sadly, this is also where Jonah's example uh, kind of goes foul and, and gets a little bit not ideal. But if, if we just continue on to the next verse, going back to Jonah 1, and looking at him as our Old Testament kind of case study. Um, I'll reread verse 2. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So a couple of things. When, when God says, go to that great city, um, he's not talking about the quality of the city. Um, by and large, Nineveh is, is kind of the consummate, just evil, pagan, sin-filled capital of commerce of this Assyrian empire that embodies everything that is against God. Okay, so for Jonah, um, who's been raised to follow God, who's been raised as a Jew, okay, it just embodies everything really that he hates. Um, and there's other personal grudges with the way those people have treated the Jews where he just, he doesn't like them, he doesn't want to be around them, he doesn't want to minister to them, okay? He doesn't want them to be saved because he does not think they are worthy of the kingdom of God. He doesn't want to share heaven with them. Okay, so he literally, if you looked at a, uh, if you looked at a geographical map of that area, okay, it's as if to, to go from where Jonah was to go to Nineveh, it's kind of a northeast, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you're going to go to New York, and then instead it, to go to Tarshish is, is literally, it's like the opposite direction. It's like southwest, where it's not like I'm going to go and I'll kind of see how it works and then kind of half-heartedly do things. It's like I'm going 180 degrees, you know, forget New York, I'm going to San Diego. I'm going to the beach. I'm going to go hang out there. Um, that's what I would much rather do. That's what I'm more comfortable with. That's where I kind of feel is more my sweet spot. I'm going to make my own plan. Um, in a way, the professor said this in one of my classes that I thought was very fitting is, for us today, there, there's always a boat waiting at Joppa. If we'd rather do our own thing and kind of make our own plans and we have our own vision, there's always a boat waiting at Joppa that we can jump on. Okay, but you're going to pay the fare and you can probably expect some rough waters, uh, which we get to see as Jonah's story continues. Um, but then you jump to the Gospels, okay? And to kind of embody this point that, that God's purposes are to be elevated above our preferences. Okay, this is how Jesus says it uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Okay, Jesus says, he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, okay, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. Okay, and that's his call. That's what he communicates to his disciples. And then later in the New Testament, Philippians 2 summarizes that really, really well as far as what we see in Jesus. Okay, Paul says, 
having the same mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, okay, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so Jesus' very life, let alone how he was going to instruct his followers, is built around this idea of obedience, is built around this idea of placing God's purposes over his preferences and over his comforts. And he says, if you follow me, you're going to have to count the cost because you're not guaranteed to get everything you want. You're not guaranteed comfort. That's not what I'm calling you to. Okay, but we will be storing up riches in heaven. And thankfully, um, since this is not something that is our strong suit, um, we also get to see that, that God has a very patient, very persistent attitude in, in how he waits for us to come along. Because everything inside of us, uh, that is counter to our nature. All right, but we see throughout Jonah, as he continues to push and to call Jonah to carry out his mission, we see all throughout the New Testament, uh, when we see um, the way Jesus interacts with his disciples and the way his disciples just again and again don't, they're not clicking and they're not getting it. Um, the, the duh disciples, as I've heard it called, they just don't seem to click with anything. Um, he has that patience. He has that persistence with them. Okay, and it's no different for us today. Uh, Romans 12, 2. He says it this way. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, okay, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I think another version says his, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Okay, but it's just that principle of, of when the things that our culture and the world says are acceptable, are normal, are good, are okay, when they stand in opposition to what God very clearly spells out to us is good and okay and what is the best, when those things don't, don't line up, okay, he says do not conform to the patterns of this world. Okay, elevate your mind, um, elevate your priorities to those things that are eternal because the world around us is passing away. Okay, and everything that it's selling us is so temporary. Okay, and it'll be gone in a second. The kingdom of heaven is forever. So put Christ above culture. Put his cause above our comfort. Okay, to sum it up, God designed us to find our core identity and our ultimate value in him that our relationship with our creator would be the top priority in our lives. So that's how God designed us. God has designed ministry to be done in such a way that until we as Christians do elevate his eternal purposes above our personal preferences, we're going to be largely ineffective at living out our faith together in this world. Okay, we will stay uh, spiritual infants until we seek the kingdom first, and that's what opens everything up, and everything will be added unto us at this point. And I think the reason we find putting God and others, okay, ahead of ourselves um, is because at the root of it, it is a heart issue, okay? It is that none of us are without sin, all right? And that sin just totally just goofs up the way that we're seeing the world in comparison to how God created us to see the world. Um, I saw a, a, a little journal article, okay? It was a poll. I think it was like discipleship journal or something like that. Um, it was polling different Christians, and it was asking them to say, um, what are your greatest like spiritual challenges? Like what of these areas are the toughest for you? And it gave them like 15 different things. Um, and here's what the top five came back to be. Greatest spiritual challenges for Christians today. Number one, they said materialism. Number two, they said pride. Number three, self-centeredness. Number four, anger and bitterness. Number five, sexual temptation. Okay, so number one, we kind of just visited that, okay, that, that we like our comfort, we like our preferences, we like things to tailor to our needs rather than making sacrifices, okay, we like things more than we like people, sadly. Number two, three, and four, I think all those kind of weave in together. When you, th when you look at pride and self-centeredness as well as anger and bitterness, 
I think we could lump those all together and say um, that at large, we are very poor. Okay, we are very poor at giving grace. We're also equally poor a lot of times at receiving grace. And I think that's where the pride comes in is, is if we're at odds with somebody, if one of our relationships is broken, okay, if we have a debt to pay to somebody, we want to work, okay, on our own merit to kind of settle the score, okay, and that's what makes us feel good. Um, we're not looking kind of for handouts. We're not looking for, for a pity party on our behalf. Uh, we just want to know what we need to do to fix it, okay, and that's not, um, that's just not the picture that God is calling um, for us to do as we respond to the gospel and as we lead others to respond to the gospel as well. If that's the way that we present these things to be done, I don't think that's the best picture. I think um, for, for the key point number three, okay, of how has God designed his messengers in their ministry, okay, he has designed uh, that confession, okay, genuine, deep, heartfelt, genuine confession and repentance, okay, will lead 100% of the time to compassion, to his compassion and forgiveness, okay? So our confession leads to his compassion, okay? And that has to happen. That has to be the first step before we can go any further in reconciling ourselves in broken relationships, especially with God, okay? It starts on our end with admitting that we don't have it all figured out, okay? So we can read that if we go to Jonah and skip to chapter three. So for the rest of, verse, uh, for the rest of chapter one and chapter two, Okay, that's the part of the Jonah story that everybody knows, where he's on the ship. We, we saw him get on the ship trying to do his own thing. That obviously gets tossed about, and there's this huge storm, and even these professional sailors are freaking out and throwing cargo overboard like a storm they've never seen before. Jonah gets tossed over. Everybody knows the fish story. We're not going to talk about the fish today. He gets puked out of the fish. Okay, he gets spit up onto the uh, chapter 2, verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. So chapter 3. Okay, here we go. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message I tell you. Okay, so there's that patient, patient persistence, the exact same mandate that we saw at the beginning of the book. Okay, he's waiting for Jonah to come along. Verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, According to the word of the Lord, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Wow. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Okay, verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, let them call out mightily to God, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands, who knows God may turn and relent and may turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Okay, and this is one of the clearest pictures um, that we get to see in the Old Testament uh, of a group of people who by and large have, have completely turned and been living in the exact opposite way that God has called for them to live completely repent and completely turn back towards God. Um, a few different times in that passage, you heard about people putting on sackcloth, uh, which is kind of a, it's kind of like a, like a burlap sort of material um, that was symbolic in that day of basically just putting it on and saying, you know, I have nothing to offer. You know, I am 100% completely helpless. Um, you put that on and it's kind of just that symbol that everybody knows that you're in this state of complete confessing your guilt. Okay, you can't fix yourself. Okay, I am in this position and I can't get out of it. Okay, it is a symbol of confession. Okay, and then it says the king even sat in ashes, which was another symbol of identifying with the dead. So he's not even saying, I'm in a lot of trouble. He's saying, I'm dead. 
If I carry on living the way that I am living, okay, I am dead and I will perish. All right, if we go to Mark chapter 1, okay, and look at Mark's gospel, okay, the very first red letters you see in the gospel of Mark, okay, is when, King, uh, is when Jesus uh, comes out um, to John the Baptist and he says, chapter 1, verse 15, um, it says, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. First thing Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, which if I was trying to connect the dots means that if I'm going to check out and see what this whole Jesus thing is about, maybe that's where you start. Okay, like the picture we got to see in the book of Jonah. Uh, He says it another way, Jesus says it another way in chapter 2 of Mark, in verse 17. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, okay, but those who are sick. I came to call not the righteous, but the sinners. In essence, he is saying, I'm not coming to tell you how to fix you and be your own doctor, okay? I'm not coming to heal people who don't think they have anything to be healed of, okay? I'm looking for the people who realize that they don't have it figured out, who realize that they have a sickness. I want them to repent to me, okay, confess their helplessness, and 100% of the time, that's going to be met with compassion. All right. Paul, sent, Paul goes to great, great lengths for the entire rest of the New Testament with all of his letters over and over again, saying it in different ways to different churches and different groups of people, saying in so many words, Christianity is not, this whole Jesus movement, okay, is not a code of conduct. Okay, so get that out of your mind that following Jesus or being a Christian has anything to do with what you do or don't do, and that you can be a better Christian by doing more good things and less bad things, and that if you just focus and you try really hard and you monitor your behavior and you discipline yourself, that eventually you can elevate yourself to get to a point where you are then, you're fixed, you're good to go. God now smiles upon you because you checked these things off and you ditched those bad habits. Okay, and it's just never, ever going to work that way. Okay, I had the opportunity for a little while to help um, with a, a high school ministry called Young Life. And that is just the number one thing that week in, week out, okay, that at least the youth in that community, the way they view God was this, you know, what do I do in order to earn his favor? You know, what do I do to lose his favor? It's this constant up and down, you know, where do I sit? There's no peace there's no assurance. There is no relationship there. Okay, their approach to the faith is just a series of transactions. You're making deposits and you're making withdrawals. And you're constantly worrying about are you over or are you under? Okay? It's not an outside in faith. Okay, and that's the way we want to treat it, is we want to know, what do I fix? What do I do on the outside? What do I need to change? What do I get better at? Okay, so that I can be a better and better Christian or a better representative of God. Okay, and absolutely, there are, there are certain things about the way you carry yourself uh, that will transform and that will adapt. Okay, but it's not going to start by starting on the outside and coming in. Okay, it's going to start by having your affections stirred by the person of Jesus And as you learn what Jesus has to say about us and to us and how that affects us, all the stuff on the exterior is going to take care of itself. Okay, when you have a heart that knows Jesus, that longs to have a relationship with Christ and his spirit is within you, okay, it's going to be an inside out transformation. You are not going to transform yourself by trying to go outside in. I think that's hugely important, and I think by and large as a church, okay, we miss that. Okay, and when we're ministering to people even, okay, spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel with somebody is not giving them the list of things that they need to do better and the list of things they need to stop doing. Okay, that's legalism. That's not the way it works. That's not the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace says you cannot earn your salvation. If you could earn your salvation by being good enough, then Jesus didn't have to come. Okay, that was 
that would not have been necessary for Jesus to pay for the penalty of all our sin if a select few could be good enough to earn their spot. Okay, they say, you can't earn your salvation. Okay, he earned your salvation 2,000 years ago. Okay, so that, that classic question of, you know, scale of one to 10, you know, how sure are you that you're going to heaven if you died tomorrow? I swear, if you ask people that in church, people, you'll get a lot of sixes and sevens and eights. You know, like, I'm pretty sure I'm definitely better than that guy. Not as good as that guy. He's like a nine. I'm probably like a 7.5. And that's just not what the Bible says. And that's not what Jesus came to do. He didn't, came, uh, he didn't come to, to rate different spots on the scale. He came to make it that that answer to that question is either zero or ten. It's either you have accepted the substitutionary death that covers all of your sin or you haven't. If you have, you can say without a shadow of a doubt that it's a 10 because it's not based on your performance in this life. It's based on my performance and my perfect life and my death on the cross. And if you haven't, you haven't. And it's that simple. It's that simple. It is not a game. The Christian life is not this game of tug of war where we're constantly trying to keep our heads above water and stay in God's good graces. Okay, that's not our job. That's not for us to do. Okay, Jesus achieved that. It is done. That is why on the cross he cried, it is finished. If we are in him, we have security because our confession leads to his compassion 100% of the time. Okay, so God designed us to rely on him and have all of our deepest needs met by him alone. Um, I think Nicole said that really well when she came up here. Um, We need him. That's step one, establishing that there is a need there. All right, and God has designed our ministry in such a way that genuine repentance is the first essential step towards reconciliation, not behavior reform, not fix these exterior things, okay? You can't fix yourself. There's no curing your own sin. That's just the truth. And just like you can't fix yourself, you can't fix other sinful people either. Okay, and if you think you can, okay, by being a powerful, most, you know, a charismatic enough evangelist that you can go save people, okay, you're going to have a really tough time feeling encouraged and feeling successful and being used by God. Okay, we have to know that it's not on us. We can't fix ourselves. We can't fix people. But what we can do is make them aware of the sickness that we all have, and we can point them towards the great physician. And he can heal them, and he does, time and time again. Last illustration, Um, I'm a huge football junkie. I love watching football, uh, playing fantasy football, all of that stuff to where when it comes to following NFL and college football, I'm all about it. Um, specifically my two teams, and I'm probably about to make a bunch of enemies in here. Um, College, I'm I'm a Texas A&M guy, and I grew up in Houston, so I'm I'm on with the Texans. I know that I'm in Dallas, and this is cowboy country, uh, but I'm Aggies, and I'm Texans, so there's this unique situation. If you're not aware of what's going on, uh, the NFL draft happens every April. It is where teams get to pick the most talented players from college to become part of their teams, Uh, The Houston Texans, because we had such a magnificently terrible season, we get the first pick in the draft, so we can choose anybody we want to. Uh, The Texas A&M quarterback, Johnny Manziel, is available for the draft. People think he's a really great player. There is potential that the Texans will pick him first overall. Where is he going with this? I don't know what the the general manager is going to do with that first pick. I don't know if we're going to pick Manziel, if we're going to pick a quarterback, if we're going to do something completely different. Here's what I do know. I know that the general manager will not draft Johnny for the purpose of making him rich and making him feel privileged and making him feel special and famous, as much as I'm sure Johnny will do those things because he's kind of an egomaniac. That's not the heart behind drafting him, okay? If we choose to make him a part of our organization, we're not doing that to elevate the name of Johnny Menzel, okay? It's not about the name on the back of his jersey. It's about the name on the front, We want him as an organization 
Okay, we want him on our side. We want him to make us better. Okay, we want him to be on our team because we feel like he can do some magnificent things. Okay, so th- the fourth and final point, okay, of, of, of our message this morning, what is God's design for his messengers and for their ministry? Okay, is it right after confession will lead to compassion? Okay, someone's conversion simultaneously marks their commission, their great commission. Okay, I can't say this any clearer. Ministry is not for pastors. Okay, ministry is for believers. Okay, so if you have a professing faith in Jesus Christ, ministry is part of your deal. Um, It's not for certain qualified people who have certain characteristics. Um, It's for all of us. Okay, Matthew 9 And we'll close with this. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, we could see that at the end of Jonah Chapter 4, verse 11, God says, Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? A sheep without a shepherd, people who don't know their left hand for their right hand, God has compassion on them. Verse 37 in Matthew 9. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Okay, God designed us to know him, and he designed us to make him known. Okay, and he designed ministry in such a way that followers of Christ should preach the gospel at all times uh, and when necessary, use words. And it is necessary to use words, by the way. Okay, but our lives should be a testimony to the non-believing world, not the other way around. Um, One of the key ways that he's called us to mark that we are um, one of his chosen people to proclaim his truths. Okay, that we put his purposes above our preferences. Okay, that our confession begs his compassion. And that our conversion results in our commission is that we come to the table, okay, and we take the elements. In the last day before um, Jesus died, he had dinner with his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you, okay, that if you take of those elements, you are identifying with all of these things. You are taking upon, um, you're taking his cross upon you to follow him, okay, so we're going to do that this morning. Um, it's kind of a family thing. If, if you're not, uh, if you're not a believer this morning, um, this is sort of a, uh, for those who are, who are of the faith and who are in the faith, um, who have a professing relationship with Jesus to symbolically um, kind of renew that this morning by taking communion together. Um, if you would like to partake in communion, um, we would love for you to. Um, there's two tables. There's one at the front. They're in these silver trays. Okay, you just take a cup. Um, the juice and the cracker kind of both come in one little easy-to-go package. Um, before we do that, though, let's, let's take just a moment um, to just kind of present our hearts to God, uh, make sure they're pure, um, make sure to confess just if there's anything um, that is keeping you from being fully um, open with God and open to His will and putting His purposes over your preferences. Um, just take a minute and, and present those things before Him, uh, confess things before the Lord, um, and receive His compassion. Go ahead. Go ahead.